morning, everyone. Obviously having a problem with my notes. I reached in and I pulled them out and I pulled them out partially and then I got them out of order. So I'm gonna I'm gonna preach the lesson from the middle to the to the beginning and then back to the end. How does that sound? <laughs> yeah, you guys can figure it out, I'm sure. Yeah, Star Wars, yeah. Um as I mentioned uh, to everyone, I guess it was back either the end of October or in uh, the beginning of November, that as th- through the fall I was doing a series on questions from the Bible, but I was going to be asking in the new year for submission of Bible questions or topics in the uh, for the evening lessons coming into this year. I'm going to kick that series off tonight. I haven't received any yet. I haven't solicited those things yet but I'm soliciting them from you now. If there's something that you don't understand or there's something you would like a further understanding of, a text that you're struggling with, um, if you will submit that to me in writing with your name on it, I promise not to use your name unless you specifically give me permission to, Um, but I'd like your name so that if I need clarification of what you're asking, I can come back to you and you can help me understand further what it is that you're looking for, and then I will do uh, be doing lessons on those, helping to understand better. So tonight, as a part of this, I'm going to call this series that that you all are going to contribute to with your questions uh, about the text, uh, digging deeper, so we can get deeper into God's Word, understand it better, and with a better understanding, be able to follow more clearly what God has given us to follow. Um, I'm grateful for for questions. Uh, I have received a number of questions I didn't know the answer to in my life. Um, and It causes me, when I don't know a question, that I've got to dig deeper to find the answer. And so it may be an area that I haven't spent much time studying, and you have a question on it, well, it's going to cause me to have to spend time uh, and so we can learn together and grow together. So that's, that's an important uh, part of the learning process. Tonight we're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 2 as we uh, open this series of lessons up. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Shall we pray together? Our Heavenly Father, Thank you so much for your guidance, for your instruction, for the love that you put into your word, for helping us, Father, as we fumble through this life by providing us a light in the darkness. We thank you, Father, for minds to comprehend, for hearts with desire to do your Pray that you would bless us, Father, as we seek to dig deeper into your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we want to talk about digging deeper into God's word. You know, a superficial understanding of God's word is enough for us to be able to know what we must do in order to be saved. It does not require that we have a Ph.D., in biblical languages to know what to do to be saved. However, that understanding of what we must do to be saved is our jumping off point. It's not our ending point as far as our relationship with God's Word. We've got to learn. We've got to grow. As a matter of fact, Peter concludes his final letter that we have a record of, 2 Peter chapter 3, with grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus grow in grace and knowledge 
you can only do that by applying yourself to the written text. You know, prayer helps with that. Other things help with that. But the Bible has to be primary in that in that uh, relationship. And so we want to talk about this for a few moments tonight about the importance of it. So I would invite you to join me in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, 15 through 19. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. And their message will spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands. Having this seal, the Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. We're not going to exhaust these verses tonight, but I want to briefly talk about a couple of things, and then we're going to dig into verse 15 in particular. Profane, verse 16, and idle babbling will increase to more ungodliness. When we interject worldly wisdom into biblical truth, it only undermines our faith. And it will lead us towards more ungodliness, not more godliness. Social media is good for a lot of things, and I'm not sure what they are. Um, but I, uh, the worst theology in the world is on things like Facebook. You know, everybody wants to be able to, to solve the world's problems with one verse from the Bible, or a partial verse from the Bible, or a misunderstanding of a verse from the Bible, and then you get that going out, and it's not good. There's um, a lady that I went to school with at Auburn University many years ago put on Facebook about being kindled in the fire uh, with which we have kindled. And she just talked about how encouraging that was. It was from Isaiah. And I knew that it didn't sound right, so I went and looked it up, and it's talking about what God's punishment's going to be upon his people for the fire they have kindled by worshiping idols. And I contacted her privately. You know, I didn't try to embarrass her uh, online. She removed the post afterwards, by the way, and explained it to her. And she goes, well, I got it off of a religious calendar, and that was the verse of the day. Can you imagine selling a calendar with that as an encouraging verse for the day? But see, when we try to mix in or we leave things out, it only promotes ungodliness. It doesn't promote godliness. Um, now, we all understand that cleanliness is next to godliness is not in the Bible, right? It's a really good practice. You know, I, I would never discourage someone from personal hygiene. But it's not in the Bible. Okay? It's not in the Bible. But people promote those things as if they are in the Bible. So we have to be very careful with a lot of things. And we'll talk about that as we move forward. But I want us to spend our time talking about verse 15. Because verse 19 says, The solid foundation of God stands. That is a reference back to God's word and our diligence in our study of it. First thing I want to do is I want to examine this phrase, rightly dividing. We're going to break down just a couple of parts of it, and then we want to talk about how we apply this. Rightly dividing. The New King James that I'm reading from says, rightly dividing the word of truth. The NIV says, correctly handles the word of truth. The English Standard Version says, rightly handling. I'm presenting that to you to show you some 
um, popular versions of the Bible and how they uh, try to bring that idea forward. So the the whole point is, it's, it's kind of hard to misunderstand what the original language is saying because these are all basically saying the same thing. Rightly dividing doesn't mean that we're dividing the truth necessarily, but we're understanding it properly. We're not trying to divide God's word, but there are divisions within God's word we must understand. We also have to handle correctly God's word. Now, all of this, I say, to tell you this. The implication in that is that it may be wrongly handled. God's word is wrongly handled a lot. There is a lot of ignorance in the world of religion, and I think it surpasses politics, and that's awfully hard to do. 66 books of the Bible written by God to man in a way that we can understand it. We'll talk about that a little bit further here in a moment. And we do everything within our power to mess it up. And you look at all the religious divisions in the world, those are all the result of people having different understandings of a singular Bible from God that tells everybody the same thing and we can't figure it out. Well, is it that we are married to our traditions, perhaps? Is it because we trust preachers more than we trust the Word of God? Perhaps. Is it because we don't want to disappoint our family and leave what our, our family history is? Perhaps. But ultimately, it comes down to personal responsibility when we wrongly handle the Word of God. Because it doesn't matter what your preacher, pastor, priest says about the Word of God. You have a responsibility yourself to search the scriptures as the Bereans did in Acts chapter 17 daily to ensure that it is being taught correctly to you and preached correctly. You have an individual responsibility. And when it is not taught or preached correctly, you have the responsibility to try to get that corrected. And when it's not corrected, you need to show somebody the door, whether it's me or anybody else. You don't put up with, with false teaching and with people that are trying to uh, sell you something that's not in the Bible. You have to, Paul is writing to Timothy, the evangelist, telling him to rightly handle God's word. The implication is, Timothy, be careful not to wrongly handle God's word. Second Peter 3 gives us a perfect example of that, beginning in verse 14. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, talking about the end of the world, the, the material things going away, and heaven uh, being presented to those who have inherited it. Looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. And consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of things in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the Scripture. That final verse there, verse 16, is a challenging verse. Even Peter acknowledges through inspiration of the Spirit that some of Paul's writings are difficult. They make you scratch your head sometimes. You have to really apply yourself to some of the principles and deep truths that God is relaying to us through the Apostle Paul. But it doesn't say they are impossible to understand. It says they're difficult. And in some places, people take scriptures, such as Paul's, according to Peter, they twist them to their own destruction as they do the rest of the scriptures. God's word can be wrongly handled. And that's something that is extremely important for us, especially when you want to dig deep. When 
we want to dig deep. But God's word can be rightly understood. When we handle it correctly, we can understand it correctly. As Peter has said here in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16, hard to understand is not impossible to understand or can't be understood. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That is a very deep and abiding truth that is not hard to understand. And that is, in essence, the theme of what we have throughout Scripture. But there are other things that are much more difficult to understand. But we serve a God who knit us together. Our minds created language for us to communicate and then revealed his word in the language predominant to the day in which it was written in the Old Testament and then in the New Testament in the Hebrew and in the Greek in languages that were everyday languages that can be translated into the other languages of the earth in a fashion to where they can be understood the way God intended to claim that God's word cannot be understood is to level an indictment against God. Why would God reveal to us a word that could not be understood? There are things God did not reveal to us. There are ways of God we have talked about before that are much higher than our ways. But the much higher ways are not what he's revealed to us. Now, there are still things we are not going to understand as we try to read between the lines of Scripture. But when it comes to the words of Scripture, we can understand with proper uh, diligence. We can understand what God has intended for us to understand. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13 the Apostle John writes these words toward the conclusion of his first epistle. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Why did John write this epistle? That the original recipients and then those afterward would know something. In order to know it, you have to understand what he is writing. And what is that that you can know? That you have eternal life. This is not a once saved, always saved passage. But you can know that if you are doing God's will, if you're walking in the light as he begins his letter, if you are abiding in him as he talks about in the second chapter, if you know him, if you work righteousness, all of these phrases he used throughout here, if you're following God's word, you can know you have eternal life. But we also understand that that eternal life can be lost. It can be lost. But we can understand what God is teaching through these human instruments who have put pen to paper. God preserving it down through all these years. It can be understood. Now this idea of diligence, before we once again get into our application aspect here. Diligence is the word that is used in the New King James. The uh, King James Version says study. And what study meant when the King James was translated, what study means today, it's changed a little bit in its uh, impression. To study something back when the King James was translated was to apply complete effort to a thing. Nowadays, when we talk about studying, it might be putting an hour in the night before we have an exam. And we call it study. That was not part of how we understood it in English many years ago, but now it has many different understand, uh, 
levels of understanding. But this idea of giving diligence or being diligent carries a stronger sense than the word study does today. Be diligent. The New Living Translation says, work hard to present yourself approved. The English Standard Version and NIV say, do your best to present yourself approved. Diligence is something that is not haphazard. It's something that you have to apply effort to. You have to make up your mind you're going to do something. And so how do we rightly divide God's word? And when we're putting diligence in, what are some of the things that we can know? Well, the first thing that I think is very important for us is being able to differentiate between the old and the new. The things that were for previous groups of people versus the things that are for the present age. We need to be able to distinguish between those things. I have a trick I play on my students when I teach homile- or, uh, hermeneutics, which is the science of interpretation. And I always begin my class, and so if you take my class, you already know the answer to this. But I always begin my class, do you have to obey all the commands in the Bible? And inevitably, about half the class will say, absolutely, you've got to obey God's word. And I will then ask them, when are they going to build their ark of gopher wood? And they're like, well, well, that wasn't for us. And I said, that's your first lesson in hermeneutics. That command is not for you. Go sacrifice your son like we talked about this morning on the mountains of Moriah. That is not for us. It was a command, but it's not for us. And so we have to rightly divide the commands that are applicable in the Christian age versus those which are not. In the Hebrew letter, the writer begins with a fascinating opening. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. Okay, various times, various ways. What does that mean? Well, that means if God wants to speak to somebody through a donkey, he's going to do it. Right? Because he did. That's a various way, is it not? That's a various way. But God has used many different ways in times past to relay his word to the fathers, to those who led God's people, going even all the way back to Adam himself. And he used prophets, those who would proclaim the word. Has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Here, even in the opening of this letter, there is a differentiation between times past and times present very important for us to understand. The writer is trying to undo some misunderstandings between the covenants. And as we get further into the Hebrew letter in chapter 8, beginning in verse 6, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Now, before we go any further, let's, let's think about that for just a moment when something is better what does that say about that which came before it's not as good it doesn't mean it wasn't good but it's not as good all right now sooner or later they're going to run out of words in the english language to tell us how improved our laundry detergent is right It's ultra, it's, you know, all of these things. We come up with these words. And it doesn't mean that what we did before wasn't good, but, you know, you you need this new stuff because it's better. Right? That's the same with a new car or a new whatever it is. Newer is better. Not always. 
But when it comes to God's word, absolutely. He has obtained a more excellent ministry, mediator of a better covenant. Doesn't mean the first covenant was bad. It was good. It was from God. But there was a shortcoming to the covenant. And it wasn't on God's side. It was on man's side. And this better covenant was established on better promises. Does that mean the promises of the old weren't good? No, those promises were were amazing. What was the promise of the old? The promise of the old is I'm going to bless all nations through this seed. And you, Israel, my people, will be the vessel through whom this seed comes into the world. So the promise was of the coming Messiah. What's the promise of the new covenant? Eternal life in heaven. Now, which is the better promise? Not that the other promise wasn't good, but now we have something even greater to look forward to, and that's eternal life. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for the second. The fault in the first was we couldn't keep it perfectly, and if you were guilty of one aspect of it, you were guilty of all of it. And there was no way to undo that. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when, <coughs> excuse me, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. That is a quotation from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. A prophecy from the weeping prophet as he is watching the destruction of Judah. He's watching them just waste the promises and the blessings of God. But God is telling them, even in his wrath, he is telling them, I've got something better coming. There's something better that's on the way. Verse 13, the Hebrew writer then picks up. In that he says, a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. What is that that is becoming obsolete and ready to vanish away? It is the law of Moses. It is the old covenant. And there was a 40-year grace period that took place between Calvary and the destruction of Jerusalem. God allowed the Jews to continue their religion up until A.D. 70 as he is trying to draw them to his son. He gave them every opportunity that he possibly could. 40 years. 40 is such an amazing number. God loves that number. We don't know the complete significance of it. When you think about 40 days and 40 nights and 40 days in the wilderness and 40 years of this and 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, all through the scriptures, God loves 40. Well, from A.D. 30, Jesus' death, our calendars are off a couple of years. I can explain that to you another time. A.D. 30 to A.D. 70 is how long? It's 40 years. And from the crucifixion of Jesus to the destruction of Jerusalem, which Jesus foretold in the book of Matthew, God gave them 40 years to figure it out. They were still carrying on things in the temple, but in A.D. 70, God sent the Romans, just like he had sent in the Babylonians to Judah, just like he sent the Assyrians into the ten northern tribes, and he destroyed the Jewish religion by taking the temple down. The genealogies went with them. And now to this day, no one knows who a Levite is. You don't know if that's your lineage if you're a Jew. You don't know what tribe you're a part of. And only the Levites 
can assist in the temple. And no temple exists. God, in his wisdom, took a false religion that was prone to violence and had them build a holy place on the temple mount so that that temple couldn't be rebuilt. And folks, 1,900 years later, nobody's raised the first stone to rebuild the temple. And they won't. God will not permit it. We have Judaism today, but it's not the Judaism of the Bible. It's a very different form of Judaism. Because there's no temple. There has not been a day of atonement where the Jews could atone for their sins in over 1,900 years because there's no temple where they can sacrifice. What's going to happen when the Jews decide they want to rebuild the temple? And they go in there and they take that mosque down that sits on top of the Temple Mount? About a billion Muslims that surround that nation will come in and there will be no one left standing. God, in his wisdom, provided that that religion would never be raised up again. It's becoming obsolete and ready to vanish away. Folks, this is written towards the end of the 60s, mid to late 60s, right before the fall of Jerusalem. It's about to vanish away. And so we need to understand there's the old in in the Bible, there's the new, and that was part of God's plan that one would be taken away so that the other could come. Now, as we look at the old and the new, we see a lot of similarities. The things of God are extremely important to God. God's moral law never changed. God's moral law was the same under the patriarchal age. His moral law was the same under the Mosaic age. And his moral law is the same under the Christian age. Was it wrong to murder under the patriarchal age? Was it wrong to murder under the Mosaic age? Is it wrong to murder under the Christian age? That's a part of God's moral law. His ceremonial law, however, changes with each dispensation, how we approach God and the sacrifices that are offered, etc. So there's a lot of things that we can distinguish between the old and the new. The second part of rightly dividing is accepting all that is written in Scripture on a matter. We as people are lazy. That's a very general term, the we. We're lazy, and we find one verse, and we think that's all that God has written on a subject, and then we hang on to it. And it may be a verse that is overly harsh and limiting in what it says, or it may be a verse that seems to allow liberty in a thing where we might want to see some liberty. But if you don't take all of what God has said on a subject, you can't know what the mind of God is with that It is very important for us to understand that. For instance, in Jesus' temptation in Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into a holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. You see what Satan did? Satan plucked a little bit of scripture out to try to tempt him to do something that was not a part of God's will. Jesus, understanding the entirety of God's word, he had used the scripture against Satan in the first temptation. In the second one, Satan decides he's going to turn around and, and play dirty pool and throw it back at him. And then Jesus goes and says, it's written you're not supposed to tempt God. And that would be tempting God to jump on. Yes, those scriptures are true that you just quoted to me, but that's not the whole truth. 
Just because he's not going to allow my foot to be dashed against the stone doesn't mean that I can tempt God in this matter. People do this too, don't we? We take a verse without considering all that is written on a matter, and it creates a problem. We also need to understand literal, or excuse me, figurative language in light of literal language. There's too many times that we will look to a passage that is intentionally figurative and try to make it the keystone to an argument. There's a principle that I was taught many years ago, and and I teach it as well, is you never interpret a difficult to understand passage in a way that it undermines the clear teaching of another passage. Because if this passage undermines this one, you're either getting one, the other, or both of them wrong. Because it can't be both. And if you're looking at figurative language, which we use all the time, I'm starving to death. Anybody in this room ever said that before? That is called hyperbole. It's figurative language. My back is killing me. No, it's causing you pain. You're not dead. It's figurative language, okay? But in the Bible, we have figurative language many times. But we don't use that figurative language to interpret literal teachings. We do it the other way around. We interpret the figurative in light of that which is literal. For instance, we touched on this this morning in Luke chapter 14, verse 26. Jesus speaking here, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brother and sister, yes, even his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Is Jesus teaching us to hate our parents? That is figurative language. He is using hyperbole to make a point. And he is also showing us how our love for one thing would make it even appear that we would be hating another thing that we do love. Mark chapter 10, 17 through 19. Matthew. That's not the verse I'm looking for. Let's go to Mark. I know I'm the only one here that's ever done that, right? Turn the wrong book and then it doesn't make sense when you get there. I'm attempting to rightly divide and I'm I'm defeating my own purpose. Uh, Chapter 10, beginning in verse 17. Now as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one. That is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. What was the question? What must I do to inherit eternal life? What does Jesus say? Honor your mother and father. So how can he say in another place you need to hate your mother and father? We need to take the literal and apply it to the figurative and understand he's speaking in figurative language to make a point. And we need to do that with all figures of speech, especially the religious world has lost its mind on the book of Revelation. It is highly symbolic language, very figurative, but there are still things we can understand that that help us in our Christian walk. But we've got to be really careful about turning locusts that are flying into armor-plated helicopters. We laugh, but I've heard preachers mention that before, along with a lot of other absurdities. But as we conclude this idea of hating our mother and father, in the terrible scene on the cross the apostle John records for us in John 19 beginning in verse 25 now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother 
and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, he's referring to John, standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own house. Jesus had one purpose in coming to the earth. That one purpose was to die for our sins. In the middle of dying for his sins, he violates his own commandment to hate his mother by taking care of her. Now, what are you going to believe? That we're supposed to hate our parents, or is he using figures of speech? You see, the oldest son was responsible for their mother when the father would die. Otherwise, she would be destitute. And it would be his responsibility to provide another caretaker. Let me present you with some interesting history of the first century. There's going to be 12 guys that were the primaries. 13 when you add Paul to the mix. But the twelve, Matthias, who was there from John's baptism through the resurrection, was chosen to take Judas's place. Of those twelve, there's only one that is going to live past the fall of Jerusalem. Which one do you suppose that is? That would be John. Do you think Jesus knew that? He did. With whom did he entrust his mother? The one that he knew that would outlive her. How much did he love his mother? And when we read outside the Bible, some historical documents, we see that John took her with him to Ephesus while he was ministering in Ephesus, and that's where she died, while she was living under his care. Just like Jesus had asked John to do. And here's John saying, from that hour that disciple took her into his own house. That's amazing. Yeah, Jesus wasn't teaching us to hate our parents. He was getting us to understand how devout our love for him should be. In 1 Timothy, the Apostle Paul encouraging this young preacher, verses 13 through 16 says, Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, you will, both, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. There's a lot for us to glean from that. But primarily, what I would like for you to understand is the instructions that he gives to the young preacher here are not limited to preaching. We should all be diligent and give our attention to the reading, to doctrine, and take heed to ourselves. Be careful and watchful with the doctrine because how we handle God's word will not only affect us, it will affect others around us. I look forward to your submissions. Um, I will submit my own that I don't understand if you don't. So, that was tongue-in-cheek for those that are still awake. But it's a, it's a fun exercise. I mean, if you love God and, and you want to know more, it's fun to, to investigate things you don't understand. And it is so rewarding because once you dig deep and once you find out those truths, guess what? Nobody can ever take those things away from you. I have two advanced degrees, both in Bible. I may lose my mind. I may lose my fortune. I may lose my family. I may lose everything that I have, but nobody could ever take away my education. That's something that once it's yours, it's yours. And nobody can take it away from you. 
Education in the Word of God is critical to us as people of God. To understand, nobody can ever take away that education from you. Tonight, our brothers prepared a song to encourage us. And if you need prayers for perhaps sin that's entered back into your life, discouragement that has come your way, maybe problems with your health or other such things, we'd love to pray with you, pray for you, and encourage you this evening. If you've never named the name of Christ and you need to put him on in baptism, being buried with Christ and raised to walk in newness of life, we'd love to assist you with that as well. But whatever your need is, please make it known to us as together we sing.